We're talking about your new book, Nullification. Um, and I guess my first question is, why should people who love liberty care about this idea and this book? Well, if you love liberty, you can't stand the federal government. You can't stand any level of government whatsoever. So what I think this book helps to do is to equip Americans and a lot of people who wouldn't normally come to Mises Org or wouldn't be in our circles with a new way of thinking. I think a lot of people are genuinely frustrated about what's going on with the federal government. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and no matter how much you oppose it, it keeps getting bigger. Everybody's against the bank bailouts. The bank bailouts go through. What can people do? And they feel like, well, you know, we've had enough conferences on the Constitution. We've handed out enough pocket constitutions. We voted for this stooge instead of that one, and nothing seems to work. Yeah. So what I'm doing with this book is tapping into that frustration and saying, well, Given that everything you've tried has failed, unfortunately, why don't we revisit Thomas Jefferson's approach? And, and Jefferson did indeed have advice. How do you fight against this seemingly unstoppable force of the federal government? And his view was, you simply say, well, we're not doing it. Right. And you do this through the intermediary of your state governments. And you say, we're not doing Like You know and I know you're not allowed to do what you're doing. And so therefore, in this state at least, we're not going to allow it to be enforced. And that was Jefferson's view was that political power in so much as so far as it exists at all has to be broken up into little bits and the little bits have to be the bulwarks against the giant bit and if they don't perform that function then yes you're going to continue to be frustrated but at least if you can pit them against each other right. if you can get them fighting against each right. other you know like the Nazis against the commies right. then maybe people can find some reservoir of liberty. Now, is your, is your sense that uh, Jefferson proposed nullification as a kind of an emergency tactic, an emergency strategy to be used only in extreme cases like revolution or secession, or is it, or is it something that's supposed to be an ongoing threat? I think it is supposed to be an ongoing threat. I mean, in Madison's Virginia Resolutions of 1798, he said that the, the states were duty-bound to resist. Now, on other occasions, he's more timid and says, well, you know, only in extreme cases. But if you're going to say that they're duty bound to resist rather than this is something they could consider, maybe they could flip a coin and see if they yeah. should do it. Well, that sort of language indicates that this is meant to be a standing weapon in the arsenal of the people. P part of the structure of the government, uh, the t part of the check and the balance. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I just got an email the other day, the first one I've gotten along these lines from a sort of traditional, a guy who described himself as a Reagan conservative. Yeah. Now, some of these Reagan conservatives are all for this right now at this particular moment. Uh, I'm yeah. grabbing them. Right. But this guy was arguing that, uh, you know, look, with nullification, you know, all bets are off. But right now, we've got at least we have checks and balances now. Yeah. And so I thought, what, thought what, what, what checks and balance? What check and balance what, is? But what do people mean by by that? They mean like the Congress checks the Supreme Court. Yeah, Supreme right. Court's yeah, together, yeah, but yeah, they're exactly. all working together. They're all right? working together. They're right. all part of the same thing. <laughs> right. It's just totally ridiculous. I mean, if if one member of the mafia checks the other member of the mafia, yeah. but they're all part of the same family and they've all got a gun to your head, what right. what the heck difference is it? So make? Uh, this check and balance, the check of the power of the states against the federal government, is arguably more important. It's than, much more important. Yeah. I mean, Jefferson was was utterly uninterested in the checks and balances of the, of the federal government. Yeah. No, if if you can keep power limited at all, and, and a lot of the framers were pessimistic about the long run, but it's gonna have to be checking ambition against ambition. Yeah. And now it's not to say that the states are wonderful institutions. No, I mean, not. yeah, they're, they're, they're full of sociopaths too. Well, I think you need to go into something here about the structure. I feel like sometimes when you're explaining this topic, it's almost like you're having to um, conjure up a, a conjectural history or an imagined uh, existence that nobody even understands. I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about the structure of the United States that nobody has experienced and hardly anybody even understands anymore. Yeah, right. I mean, a, a United States in which Thomas Jefferson would, would talk about the possibility of states 
uh, prosecuting federal officials for treason against the state. Right. I mean, like, this yeah. is like a what? Yeah, like, you got to throw them in jail for a statement like that. But or, or that Jefferson would would refer to Virginia as our country and yeah. the United States government as some foreign entity. I mean, this right. is the way he thought. Yeah. And you know that is Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration right. of Independence, talking. Well, this is the it's whole founding me. generation, right? I mean, they were citizens of their states. That was how they thought of it, by and large. And, and now it's true you have nationalists uh, too, but the fact is that. The Constitution was sold in the ratifying conventions in a certain way, and that's what matters. What did people who voted to ratify this thing, for all the problems it's had, and it's, you know, obviously it has not served to restrain the federal government, if that's even possible, yeah. but the point is they were sold it as something that would have this many powers. And in Virginia, they were sold it on the grounds that if it tried to reach for an additional power, Virginians would be exonerated from that. Right. They could just simply point to the statute and say, well, we never authorized that. We, we're not part of this, so we don't have to enforce that. that. That's in there. And then we see from 1798 on, we see uh, Virginia and Kentucky standing up against violations of free speech. And that was soon after the Constitution. Yeah, 10 years and, and after talk, Virginia ratified. Yeah, okay, so yeah. talk about the violations of free speech that they were resisting. Uh, this always amazes me. Actually. Yeah, yeah, I think so a lot of Americans don't even know about it. No, but the Constitution passed what year, and that's... Well, 1788, they get the, the requisite number of states. And then the, uh, the resistance to the, um, the violations of free speech, the, uh, the Kentucky res res resolves, and, uh, when did that, and that comes about in... That's 1798, Virginia and Kentucky... Okay. have these critical documents that have just been, by and large, so forgotten. So what were the historical circumstances that led to this? Well, circumstances were there was something called the quasi-war with France, which is sort of an on-again, off-again series of naval clashes with France that really were not exactly, you know, what we would hear today called a, an existential threat to, yeah. you know, the, to Western civilization. I yeah. mean, it wasn't anything like that. Yeah. And, and, in fact, John Adams, the president, you know, privately admitted, you know, there is a really no chance that a French army is going to invade. Like, we all know that. Right. But nevertheless, he played it up, and, you know, he would go in public with a sword by his side to indicate that if he, if he were to run into a Frenchman, he would know just <laughs> what to do. But th 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 this was exploited by the Federalist Party as a way to clamp down on the Jefferson's party, the, re the uh, Republicans, not the heirs of the Republicans today, uh, their opposition to the Federalists, they clamped down on that opportunistically because of the war. And they said, well, you know, we got a war going on. We can't allow you people to be criticizing our commander in chief and all, right. all this, right? Typical propaganda. And the partisan nature of this legislation is pretty obvious. I mean, it said, can't criticize the president or the Congress. But it doesn't say anything about criticizing the vice president. Right. The vice president was Jefferson, right. who belonged to a different party. Right. So you can, so I mean, it was pretty obvious. So we had there were journalists who were imprisoned for criticizing the government. There was a U.S. congressman from Vermont who who was who fought in the American Revolution. So I mean, I think his credentials are pretty sound. Yeah. And and his criticism of Adams was so mild, and yet he was put in prison for it. But yet he was. He was reelected to Congress from prison, yeah. so it's okay. great. So, but it was this was you know Jefferson and Madison were sort of of the belief. Well, you know, I, we've looked at the Constitution and we're we're pretty sure you're not allowed to do this. So, the, the, you know, the, the usual response today would be, well, you know, refer it to the courts. The courts will put things right. But you know, okay, number one, the courts of that day were filled with Federalists. They were they were all appointed by Federalist president, so obviously they're going to uphold the law, so that's yeah. no answer. But secondly, Jefferson's view was that the, in, in general, the federal courts are likely to just rubber stamp everything, which indeed is exactly what they have done, yeah. which has not stopped some conservatives from still giving us that advice. Yeah, we'll wait for the Supreme Court. Are you freaking kidding? When is it? When's that strategy going to bear fruit? The year twenty five oh three? Right. I mean, wh are you kidding? Right. This has got to be a joke. But also just the logic of it. The courts, the federal courts, are part of the federal government, so they're not they're not exactly impartial arbiters between the federal government and the states. No, he said, no, this is totally pointless. Yes, the the federal courts have a role to play, interpreting the Constitution and warning about violations of the Constitution, but everybody has that responsibility: the Congress, the President, the states, everybody. And if the states don't have this power, if only the federal government monopolistically gets to determine what its powers are, it's going to keep discovering more and more powers. Right. It'll be a greater and greater reservoir of powers. So Jefferson's view was that, no, 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 no. And elections 
are, are not enough either because you know sometimes people elect doofuses. I mean this yeah. this has happened. Right. So that can't be. And and also there are lots a lot of time between elections. A lot can happen. You could everybody could be in jail by the time of the right. next election. And plus, what if you vote for even if you vote for some good guy like some by some miracle there's a good guy and you vote for him. Then he gets in office and just again stabs you in the back. What is the recourse that could ultimately work? And Jefferson's view was that it has to come from the state saying, we're simply not going to do this. Because at least at the state level, as destructive and sociopathic as these people can be, you might actually know your local state legislator. You right. might actually know him, and he might not actually be completely insane. He might right. not have ambitions to be president someday. Right. He might just be some guy who... In a you know, sort of misled, thinks he's doing his civic duty by being a state legislator. I mean, you can actually maybe reach a guy like that. You have zero chance against the U.S. Senate, zero chance against the Supreme Court. So that was what Madison and Jefferson called for in 1798: was the states to stand up as the protectors of their and this people. This is this is the generation that signed the Constitution, that supported the Constitution. I guess not so much Jefferson, but certainly Madison. So there's two things that strike me as remarkable about this. One is that this the fundamental attack on free speech so early mm. in our nation's history. You know, so much for uh, so much for our embedded love of freedom. I yeah. mean, it just proves that you give anybody power, they're going to abuse it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And the second thing is that uh, the whole thing's shattered very quickly. Actually, 1798. Yeah, already, yeah, already, you have to raise an alarm like this, and and Patrick. Henry in Virginia, who was in the, the Virginia legislature, was raising the alarm in the early 1790s, saying, look at this crummy yeah. Hamilton financial program. Now, yeah. right away, they're violating yeah. the Constitution. Yeah. And he, he reminded Virginians, look, we were told in the ratifying convention that if this Constitution is violated, we're not obligated to obey anything that's not right. authorized. In it. So that we, we see that right away. Uh, it is interesting, though, that when Virginia and Kentucky issued their famous resolutions saying, you know, no way, yeah. you know, we won't go, a lot of the critics today will say, well, at the time, the other states were not in sympathy with Virginia and Kentucky. Most of the southern states didn't respond at all to Virginia and Kentucky, but the northern ones were very critical of Virginia and Kentucky, and that is taken today as being definitive. Well, the northern states were critical, but if you look at why were they critical, they were critical because they liked the Sedition Act. Sure. The, uh, Massachusetts said it's a wonderful thing. We've had this terrible spirit of falsity in the press lately, yeah. and now we're smashing it, and this is wonderful. So, okay, so that means if you are against Virginia and Kentucky, by and large, you're supporting states that said suppressing free speech, A-okay. Great. And your point is that it doesn't matter who supported it. The point is that the state itself wanted out from underneath yeah, this law and, exactly. and was nullifying it, So, and that should be enough. It's yeah, that should be enough. You're yeah. not saying that nullification should only take place if you've got a you know, majority of states. Yeah, no, exactly. Right. Only and in, fact, in fact, precisely in a situation yeah, like this, right. when every other state has completely lost its mind, yeah. the court has lost its mind, the, well, then what other recourse have so you got? Traditional republicanism is not a democracy of states. Right, exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. And, and it's, it's also worth noting that you know libertarians are, of course, very sympathetic to civil disobedience. I mean, obviously, yeah. if you're against the state, you have to believe believe in the right to resist it or ignore it. Well, you can think of nullification as being a kind of civil disobedience that's sanctioned by a state government, in which right. the state government says, we're going to use our own officials to protect our people yeah. if anyone tries to hurt them for refusing to go along right. with this law. So this is part of the general federal structure, the, the old federalist idea of a decentralized republic. You've got various powers, right? You've got the possibility of secession, I suppose, that is controversial. Um, you've got the Tenth Amendment. And the nullification is also part of that. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that was Jefferson's understanding. And that since the Tenth Amendment doesn't enforce itself, right. it's going to have to be done by yeah. the states. Now, um, I'm, I'm thinking back to something Lord Acton said about the genius of the American system. He said that, that it's great innovation and it's a great contribution to the history of the world was this idea of uh, the federal structure. And yet, um, I, I don't even think libertarians have much appreciation for, for what this means. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Is it because it's gone and we can't imagine it anymore? Or, or let me ask you this, was it flawed? I mean, was it just not a good system, really? Well, it's flawed in the sense that um, you know, the states themselves are corruptible because yeah. the states themselves are founded on the same yeah. objectionable principles as the federal government is founded on. Yeah, and, sure, and, sure, sure. But, 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 and yet, uh, like even in the case of Europe, I mean, you have a European Union, but uh, we all immediately recognize the need for France and Germany to have its own you know, sovereign power, right? I was a check. Yeah, right, but because who would who would entrust his his freedom to 
this European bureaucracy. Right. Right. And, and it's not to say that you love the French government. You can despise it. Yes. But it's okay. something. Mm -hmm. It's it, and and all you've got. I mean, oftentimes your choices in life are a rotten choice and a really bad choice. Yeah, yeah. And well, sometimes you have to take the really bad choice. And again, doesn't mean that France will never do anything bad. But if it, you know, heaven forbid, it does, you have some recourse. You can move away. You can fight. You have a better chance of defeating the French government than you do the EU. I mean, you have at least some that. Out, some exactly. Some and that's yeah. you know, and Ralph Rako has been very good on this summarizing. Yeah the research on the European miracle. Like why was sustained and fantastic economic growth taking place in, in Western Europe first and in a sustained way? And what, what were the roots of this? And one of, the, one of the answers to that question involves the political system or the lack thereof, that in the wake of the collapse of the Roman Empire, no continent-wide empire took its place. What you instead had was a patchwork of tiny little principalities. Yeah. And so if one of them became too oppressive, you just move five feet away to another one, and therefore you reward the other one, which now has a bigger tax base. You penalize the one that's hurting you, so you give them an incentive to shape up, the other one an incentive to keep doing what it's doing. And so the result was, it was a kind of, as one scholar has put it, a kind of political anarchy yes. that occurred. And that allowed the free market, the breathing room, to survive. So you need this decentralized power. I mean, ideally, it would be better to have no coercive power. But at the very least, break it up into the smallest bits possible. You can I mean, if, if, yeah, yeah. if Hitler had been the postmaster general in Bavaria, you know, we'd all be better off, right? I mean, right. it would have been much better. The world would be better off if Germany had been a tiny co you know, collection of tiny states, right? I mean, who could de who can deny yeah. this? Well, and actually, uh, in uh, Mises' own nation state and economy following World War One, he recommended this kind of system for Europe. Uh, we're, at, we, we're missing the monarchs. They're gone, so now we have democracy, but democracy can't work on a mass basis. It'll only lead to tyranny, he said. So we have to have... Uh, the right of states to uh, organize themselves as independent political units and have some rights against the center. Yeah, exactly. And and th this is simply as a restraint yeah. on on the center. Yeah, I mean it's part of the old classical liberal program. It it, it is, and and some some classical liberals, I'm sure, failed to appreciate this point and just thought that if we can somehow convince the parliament to do the yeah. liberal bidding or the judges, yeah. and they can impose it on everybody. Yeah. But what in fact happens? I mean, what's more likely to happen? I mean. In doing that, you are encouraging them to exercise their powers for good. But that's not their natural inclination, and there are a lot of people who are also encouraging them to exercise those powers for ill. So yeah, you know, you might get a one victory out of 100, and you know, let's celebrate that one victory. But is it worth the 99? Or is it not better to just take your chances with, yes, this local unit is liable to do stupid things, but at least the stupidity is contained, yeah. and at least the local unit doesn't have a printing press on which it can, it can uh, impose enormous uh, burdens on the backs of the population. This is huge, the, the printing press point. I mean, this is one of the reasons the state powers are, are naturally restrained compared to the federal government. They don't, they don't have federal, federal reserves in the, all the states. You know? ex yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. and, and the obviously they're in, they, they don't have military, they have, they have a national guard. Yeah. And in the book I talk about the uh, importance of the states reasserting their authority over the national guard so that it can't be federalized and called up for missions like you know Iraq and Afghanistan, right. where it has this is not at all what people associate with the National Guard, and this is something that the left, the right, the libertarians, the military families, and active duty people, by and large, can agree on this that this is an abuse of the National Guard, and so this is at least one tiny mild check that we the people might actually have on the war machine. We have no influence over the war machine. What are some other cases where nullification has been used in American history? Well, it was used by the within 10 years of the very New England states that were up in arms that Virginia yeah. would stand up for free speech. They began to say, well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Who said you could impose a blockade on us? And in enforcing the blockade, and basically saying that you know we can't, it was an embargo, saying that we can't send our goods anywhere to any foreign port anywhere in the world. The way that was enforced was also constitutionally outrageous. If we have the mildest suspicion that you have an intent to export, we can just seize your stuff. They, oh, I don't think so. And you had, in fact, I, I have in the second part of the book is all documents. Documents from American history that no one has seen, but that need to be seen. I mean, this is my, you know, I want to argue this in as gentlemanly a way as possible. But at the same time, there is part of me that wants to stick this in their faces and say, look, I didn't make this up. Here's right. a document. Here's another one. Here's another one. If you here's care the... about American history, exactly. this, is, this is our true history. Exactly. Yeah. Here's a governor of Connecticut saying, we're not doing this. Yeah. You want us to do it. We're not doing it. What happens now? So there's that. There is uh, 
fighting against the possibility of military conscription. Yes. Daniel Webster gave a memorable speech and in which he talked about military conscription being horrendous and a violation of liberty in the Constitution. But the part of the speech that's not remembered is he said, now what if this happens? What if they actually embark on this mad pro project of military conscription? And he says, in that case, then the states must interpose their authority between the federal government and their people. They must stand in between. They must say, no, this is not going to go on. I mean, that's, that's Daniel Webster. A couple of states passed resolutions saying, if this happens, we're not doing it. So... The, and then, of course, the, you know, the South Carolina and the tariffs. That's the only thing anybody ever remembers, is South Carolina nullifying the tariffs. But even there, if you look at what happened there, South Carolina was upset that the tariff rates were going up to about, you know, almost 50%. And they said, now, you know, this is obviously meant to benefit one section of the country. You do not need to be a brain surgeon to see this. Right. So what was the result of this? Well, the result, and people say, oh, this was all about slavery. Well, at the time, nobody talked about this. You didn't hear a word about slavery. Every, every tariff advocate and tariff opponent, free trade advocate in the North and the South, all were talking about tariffs and their consequences at the right. time. And it's true, South Carolina was a slave state, but Andrew Jackson was a slave president. You know, like the, there were no angels in this situation. But when the thing turned out, like how, what, what ended up happening, South Carolina managed to get the tariff reduced gradually over time, which was, yeah. which was better than nothing. So they got something. There was a compromise worked out. They went to the brink and in fact, the federal government's offensive action was in fact forced back. Right. So why would that be a failure of nullification? It shows it, it had a good outcome. Yeah. Who objects? What, what libertarian today objects to the tariffs being lowered right. because South Carolina said, right. we're not going to pay? Is, right. is there a libertarian who says, oh, no, 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 I'm so against nullification. Let's ram those tariffs. I mean, come on. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the fighting against the fugitive slave laws, yeah. which Unfortunately, of course, there is that fugitive slave clause in the Constitution. You've got to return runaway slaves. But at the same time, the northern states said, we do have the, the power and the responsibility to protect our people against potential kidnapping. And we are not going to allow some southern guy to come into our state and say, here's a physical description of the slave I'm looking for. And, hey, that guy kind of looks like him. I mean, you know, a lot of states said, well, I don't think so. And in, in Wisconsin, they were upholding the power of the state to guarantee these poor souls a jury trial at least yeah. before they're taken away. And this was considered a terrible outrage, but well, okay, but there's nullification. And Wisconsin quoted Thomas Jefferson's Virginia, or pardon me, Kentucky resolutions word for word. That's great. We are not responsible yeah. for, for this. Isn't that great? Yeah. Um, now, uh, Back in those days, there were real impositions of the federal government against the states, uh, coercion. Uh, and I get the impression at our times, it's not so much uh, coercion against the states, it's just buyouts, it's just a, a bribery. Uh, um, quite often, for example, the federal government just says, look, if you don't go along with our laws, uh, we're going to take away your highway funds, yeah. and that's enough. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So that's part of the reason that... Um, I think there's strength in numbers here. And if you had a bunch of states forming a wall yeah. of resistance, yeah. it's very hard for the federal government to penalize them all because then we would finally see some actual turnover in federal offices because there would be a huge revolt. Uh, but, but secondly, inevitably there's going to be a, 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 a severe crisis. The federal government is going to have a severe fiscal crisis one of these days. It's just bound to happen. And so then it's going to be much harder for them to make credible threats against the states. Oh, we're going to withhold money. Oh, yeah, you, you're not going to send us any more checks that bounce? You're not going to yeah. send us any more? Your oh, wow. Oh, what will we ever do? So we might as well get the states ready for the yeah. day when that comes, ready to assert themselves. Plus, it is quite plausible as this economy continues on this path of, you know, not recovering, that you could see a group of states standing together saying, We've gone through our state budgets line by line, and we've found all these unfunded federal mandates, and hey, we don't have the resources for them anymore. So you can, you can pass all the laws you want to. You can hand down all the decisions by federal courts. The money's not there. The money's not there. What are you going to do, throw the governors in jail? I mean, I'd love to, Is that the image you want of the United States, land of the free, spreading democracy around the world, governors languishing in jail? Is that the image you want? I mean, that's what we need, because, that's, because apart from that, apart from other ambitious people standing up to these ambitious people, I don't see that there's any stopping this thing. And, and even this strategy may only stop it for a while, but you know, I'll take some breathing room 
uh, any day if, if, yeah. if we can get it. So I can imagine one of the critiques of your, your, of your point might be, look, people don't, don't identify with their states anymore. You know, uh, uh, I, I moved to New Hampshire. I'm just there for a job. You know, I'm going right. to move back to Wisconsin. You know, I may retire in Florida. I've got my, 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 my sisters in California. But that's not really the nature of your, of your no, position. It's not, yeah, it has no, nothing to do no, with cultural do that. identity. Right, although there are some people who still say, you know, I'm, all my family generations have lived in Nebraska, yeah. and we that's just yeah. how we'll always be. But no, what I'm what, what, what's being suggested here is that people uh, support their states when the states resist unconstitutional federal laws, not because I've got a lot of nostalgia for my state, but because this is the only power that seems able to do anything against right. the federal government. And it just for strictly practical, cold, it's political, not, not calculating pa- not views. Patriotism, not it's not patriotism. It's not state pa- oh, Although yeah. if, if that is some people's yeah. motivation, I'm fine with that. But even if you move all the time, like if I were to move to a bunch of different states, every state I went to, I'd be encouraging that state yeah. to stand up to the federal government because it's the only thing that at least has a remote prayer of, of stopping this, this, this steamroller. And, and of course, then we need to think in terms of, well, then how can the states be equipped with powers that would help them resist this bribery? And some have proposed, well, you're going to need some kind of federal tax escrow account where the states say, we're going to collect taxes that go to the federal government and put them in the state treasury and hold them in escrow until the federal government stops threatening us with X, Y, or Z, yeah. or stops doing this or that, or stops violating the Constitution in these areas. And then once they do that, then we'll, we'll forward the money on. Now you say, oh, the federal government would never let them get away with that. Maybe not. Maybe you have to amend the Constitution to allow that. I, I'm skeptical of constitutional amendments because you figure, well, if they haven't obeyed the Constitution up to now, why would they obey right. an amendment? But if it's a structural amendment, if it says the states are equipped with powers of resistance, where, l- let's say, if... A simple majority of state attorneys general say this federal law is unconstitutional, it's, it, then it's thereby repealed. Not just nullified in the state, but repealed. Yeah. That's a structural change that I think could actually have a, a, a good outcome. I mean, it won't repeal everything under the sun, but at least there would be a mechanism for repeal. Right now, what's the mechanism for repealing a federal law? Voting for a new congressman? How's that been working? How many federal laws have been repealed? Like one or two out of 500 zillion? But what if you had a formal process at the state level where if you just get 28 states, you can repeal a federal law? You might repeal some of them. Why not do that? I mean, again, it's not the pure libertarian solution, but it's something. Why not do it? Now, uh, the Washington Post has been running this series the last several days Mm. about about uh, the federal governments, that, but what, what do they call it? Something really inflammatory, like the secret government. Yeah, 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 secret, the, yeah, 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 top secret America. Yeah, top secret America, yeah. right. And they have a map, you know, of the United States with these red dots everywhere, where the federal government's got these uh, security installations, yeah. you know, all over the place. I mean, I, I think... Um, it's startling to see this in the Washington And, and if Post. even one of those were closed, you know, we would be overrun instantly, <laughs> of course. Ter- right. We're kind of terrorists. Yeah, and they, they run uh, the, a tight ship in these places. Right. Not, not a dime is wasted, you right. can be sure. So it, but it seems as if there's, well, less and less difference between the national government and, and anything else, doesn't it? I mean, you look at the map, you think, my goodness, you know. But I, I wonder, now, not having read the series myself, yeah. I mean, I, even though these installations are spread out all over the place, I, I mean, I, I assume these are answerable directly to the federal government yeah, by sure, and sure. large. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 the state governments may so have you, a you know, role. The core of your point is, look, there is a distinction between the states and the federal government. Let's do something about that. Let's, yeah. let's look back at American history, see why this ex- distinction exists. Right. And, and uh, re-enliven this, the, the check that, that the lower units of government yeah, have. Yeah, exactly. Let's use of, every... Yeah every defense mechanism there is and, yeah. and and you know and this is one of them exactly now yeah. now the left is by and large critical of this now of course parts of the right are critical of it too especially if one of their guys is in power how dare you nullify our sure, I, you, super you, christian you think man that the right's probably power. open more open to this now that the democrats are in charge yeah, right? exactly. that's inevitable exactly right. so that's why i got to hurry and promote this book You're really right. quickly you know <laughs> but 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 on the left i mean I, I, it amazes me that so many people on the left have this knee jerk nationalism like nationalism has been a great progressive force yeah. that so, that very statement sounds like propaganda right. why do they not see this i mean for example like the drug war a lot of people on the left are against the war on drugs and they say look what this is doing to minority communities it, it turns them upside down it destroys them I mean you know how many more black kids have to be shot in the back before something is done about this and then that's all they do they give speeches and they write articles and they say well you know maybe someday we'll get enough votes to I mean that's your that's your answer are you kidding me so in other words your blood is boiling from moral outrage but your response is well you know our overlords have told us we have to prosecute this drug war so I can 
You've got to be kidding me. And so my friend Scott Horton and Anthony Gregory have told me one thing libertarians have to do is they have to out-left the left and they have to out-right the right. That's funny. Well, I'm going to out-left the left here. I'm going to say, so you're going to sit there and tell me that it's okay with you because, hey, you know, this is our government, man. It's okay with you that this outrage goes on every single day. People are oppressed every single day, imprisoned in record numbers every single day. And instead of doing anything about it, you're going to give some speeches? I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Why don't you instead say, why don't you get a state that you consider to be by and large progressive and you have a governor or you have a mayor say, yeah, you know what, you can have your insane war on drugs. That's fine. But we're not going to devote any resources to it. We, there will be zero dollars in our budget allocated to prosecuting these crimes, period. What are you going to do about that? That's our response. But they're so afraid of being associated with the Jim Crow South that therefore they can never use the states ever again. Do you think that's the, the fundamental rationale there, the fundamental fear at work? It's, part, it's partly that. It's yeah. partly that. And, and it, it, you know, we don't want to make light of this. We don't want to make light of the indignities that, that blacks were subjected to in the South. I mean, nobody wants to do that. But does that mean that now nobody can ever use this mechanism ever again? Because if that were true... The, the left wouldn't be allowed to use the federal government ever again after the internment of the Japanese. Yeah. But yet that hasn't stopped them. That hasn't made them say, well, the federal government is discredited forever. We can never employ it Actually, ever again. there has been progress in the drug, drug war in the sense of liberalization at the state level. Yeah, because there? of medical marijuana. Yeah, medical and marijuana. then beyond, beyond medical marijuana. And by the way, on the medical marijuana yeah. front, there's a case where the Justice Department is against it. The Supreme Court right. ruled against it, and right. it's still going on. Right. So if, if the resistance is powerful enough, nullification can be made to stick. As a matter of fact, every day people are harassed uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with um, federal government. Exactly, but now... The, the states stand up exactly. for them against the feds. Right, but now the feds have said, well, we're really not going to prosecute this anymore. Yeah. And so people have actually said to me, well, you see, that's not a very good example of nullification because the Justice Department has said it's going to stand down. But that's the point. Why are they standing down? Because one day they woke up and said, you know what, our, our interpretation of the Commerce Clause is too broad. We really shouldn't be. No, of course, it's because the states were resisting. So this is a great example of it is a great working in, fact, in exactly. our time. And, and, and California has a ballot initiative to decriminalize marijuana, not yeah. just for, for medicinal purposes, but across the board. Right. Now, wh tell me what that has to do with the Jim Crow South, please. I mean, could you please tell me what in the now, world that what has about, to do with it? What about states that would actually make worse laws than the federal government would otherwise impose? Yeah. I'm thinking now of these uh, flaky... Um, minimum wage laws, like I think Oregon has even higher yeah. minimum wage laws than the federal government. What's your view of that? Is that a form of nullification? Yeah, it is. And I mean, well, or not well, really. well, given that the federal government does allow you yeah. to have high, you just can't have yeah. lower minimum wage I see. laws. Right. So, so you are st you are operating within the law. Yeah. But nevertheless, I think those, that's a, I'm all for letting states yeah. do that because then there'll be a natural sorting process. Yeah, People will right. flee, flee and run away and they will have to deal with the consequences. And, yeah. and that's, see, that's at least, that's again, that's one of the values of federalism is that at least, you know, there is, there's a competition to see where the most livable society yeah. is and people will flock to those and abandon the more predatory ones. Yeah. Again, that's at least some kind yeah. of check on these people. You know, uh, Tom, let me say this. Um, you know, Murray used to, uh, say that libertarians spend far too much time worrying about abstract principle, as important as that is, and not enough time thinking about strategy in the real world. I mean, it strikes me after your discussion today that what you've done is something very important. I mean, you've made a strategic contribution um, that Murray would, would celebrate because you've put, put a lot of thought into a way out. And it's maybe not the final answer, but it's, 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 it seems actually practical and it's certainly worth uh, thinking hard about it as part of our history. Well, I, yeah, I would just comment on that briefly yeah. because it, it is interesting that, that uh, you know, Rothbard got accused all the time or has been accused since his death of making the perfect the enemy of the good, yeah. all this nonsense. No, but yeah. that, I mean, really, you'd have to know almost nothing about him to think that. I mean, if right. you look at all the political campaigns he followed and supported, right. uh, third-party campaigns or... Um, he, he was sympathetic to Adlai Stevenson, n not because he thought he was a great guy, but because of the war issue. Sure. Because he said that the war and peace is yeah. the key thing. And so I mean, he, he was very interested and he would follow people who were imperfect, but he would say that on net, I think, you know, I would like to see this issue emphasized. This guy's emphasizing it. That's good. And, and, and yes, and he would not say, if you're not going to abolish all taxes right away, then forget it. 
No. He said, if on net you're bringing things down, then fine. What, what he was skeptical of were schemes whereby we're going to have tax reform, which right. always means higher taxes right. ultimately. Right. No, no, I don't want, if you're eliminating a tax, I'm all for it. Or a balanced and budget amendment. Balanced, or, balanced yeah, budget amendment, yeah, which is just a, a distraction. That, but this, yeah. isn't, this isn't a case of a, of a scheme. This is Yeah, no, this is just, this is an ability, this is a, a way for institutionally, because it's mm -hmm. very hard for me as an individual to say, hey, I'm going to nullify this federal right. act. Yeah, I'll be in prison in five seconds. But if institutionally there can be a way of saying, no, at, at the border of this state, that law stops, yeah. Yeah. and we're protecting people in this state from it. I don't see how that's bad. And on net, I see this as clearly being a net plus for, for freedom. There's what no about, question about, what about that. Um, uh, what about the uh, local governments nullifying state laws? Well, they, they would have a, a somewhat different rationale, because part of the rationale of the state nullification is that the states came first, so in sort of order of logical priority, they come first right. uh, temporally and logically. So. Uh, Frankenstein's monster doesn't tell the Frankenstein scientist what to do, yeah. and so you know he tells the monster what to do. So the states tell well, the federal government. That's an argument from history. What about right. but, but where's the but, but 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 strictly logically yeah. speaking, or, 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 or you know from a moral point of view, philosophical yeah. point of view, you know I'm all in favor of, of you know individuals, individuals nullifying uh, local uh, laws. local yeah <laughs> yeah I mean. Because you know, yeah. bring it down to the as close yeah. to the individual as you yeah. can get it. Well, that's what yeah. me, that's what Mises said. Yeah, the absolutely. The economy, exactly yeah. the same thing. One of the one of the uh, uh, troubling aspects of this is that uh, I've noticed that people tend to hate their local governments more because yeah. they're, they're closer. Right. And they annoy us, and we know what they're doing to us, and we right. see them every day, and they drive us crazy. I mean, it's the cops that stop us for going five miles over the speed limit. Yeah. It's the the people that. Uh, on one hand, you know, impose uh, you know drunk driving laws and then arrest people for walking home from bars for public drunkenness or whatever. I mean, or, or tell us what we can do you right. know, with our yards. And so we, we tend to, from day to day, uh, be annoyed more by local. Well, government. and also what? because you you tend to see your local U.S. Yeah. congressman only, let's say, giving a speech at the graduation of the local community and college. And you want to throw the tomatoes. Yeah, right. And, yeah. But 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 usually he's given that speech a thousand times, so you yeah. hear him and you think. Hey, you know what? That guy's all right. So you don't actually see him imposing things on you. You see him as like the sort of jovial guy who, yeah. you know, spoke at your daughter's graduation, whatever. So you're right. The, the people you really despise are the ones, you know, imposing this stupid zoning law, or this local thing. Yeah, the or driver's whatever. license bureau guy. Yeah, or, you're right. Or the who are right in your trash face. People that yeah. forgot to pick up yeah. your trash. Or, Which is you know, why what? it's better for them to have more power because yeah. precisely they are in your That's, face. Yeah. It gets you ticked off more and it gets you alert to what's going on whereas I mean we feel like it's so remote and we're so disengaged from what these people are doing in Washington that they're able to get away with a lot they more. wreck our lives in ways we don't always recognize yeah, right? we don't I even mean, know, they're, or, they're, or yeah. in ways that are buried in a 2500 page yeah. law that months later the Washington Post will say oh, gosh what a terrible shame that this was in the law nobody told us yeah. you know of course everybody in the world has tried to tell yeah. them but they you know they don't yeah. notice it Tom I wanted to thank you so much for uh, visiting on this book um, the more I think about it, I'm really glad we had this discussion because I think it's in intriguing. It's an important strategic um, uh, addition to the libertarian literature. So, well, I appreciate that. And yeah. I, I would just say that when you're talking about this and promoting it, you so enrage the political establishment. I mean, un much more than when you talk about Austrian yeah. economics even. Because I, believe me, because I've done both. And, you know, they'll say, okay, Austrian economics, well, you know, Fine, you know we don't even understand what you're saying because we're too ignorant yeah. to know economics. But this, this thing, they, they one thing they do know is disobeying. Yeah, it and to it encourage that, to the real world. it's like they yeah. just can't stand. Yeah. So we must be on to something if yeah. they're this angry about yeah. it. Well, congratulations yeah. to you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>